Hello, hello, hello. Welcome everyone. We're just gonna give it a couple minutes while we let folks in from the waiting room. We are really excited about tonight's conversation with our esteemed panelists and guests, you all. I say we give it maybe about one more minute and then we'll get started. Thank you all so much for your patience. Alrighty, <clears throat> we can go on and get started. Hello everyone, my name is Dominic Bednar. I am one of the co-founders and co-organizers for Black and Environment Week. I am also a PhD candidate at the University of Michigan researching energy justice and hope to drop that candidate within a few weeks. So wish me, wish me luck, wish me well. I am thrilled to um, be here today moderating this, this wonderful and dynamic panel um, that concludes our, our Black in Environment Week. And so today is Black to the Future, Radically Imagine Imagining Liberatory Futures. There's no such thing as a sustainable environmental future without thriving Black communities. Today's roundtable discussion will center and radically imagine an environmental future, places where Black people can thrive. We have to imagine what that looks like and co-create it. Today, we'll hear from an intergenerational panel of environmental leaders on their thoughts and visions of a future where Black people can thrive, imagine, and create towards liberation, justice, and equity. As a quick recap of our week, in which uh, sometime next week, you'll be able to, if you haven't been able to come to our other events, you'll be able to see them online. On Monday, we did a roll call, Black and Environ roll call on social media to help uplift and illuminate Black environmentalists across the globe. On Tuesday, um, our theme was Black Planet, where we talked about Black environmental legacies, present and futures. Uh, on Wednesday, we are all environmentalists, different shades of green, really helping to illuminate the diversity of what environmentalism looks like in the Black community. Yesterday, Thursday, Black to the Land, uh, we had a conversation with some Black farmers to, again, help uplift that particular type of knowledge um, and really just demonstrate what it means to be in relation to the land. Um, and today we are at Black to the Future. And so before I get started, I do want to take a moment to thank our sponsors. Black and Environment would like to express our immense gratitude to the Environmental Defense Fund and the Switzer Foundation for their generous support and sponsorship of this panel. We would also like to thank the many donors that are supported this week, including but not limited to Ayana Elizabeth Johnson, Dan Kamen, and the Black Oak Collective. Additionally, we would like to thank Bivouac in Ann Arbor for generously sponsoring our giveaways. If you need some outdoor gear, check out Bivouac during this week. Um, if you mention Black and Environment Week in store or put it in your online order, 20% of your purchase will go to supporting our week. Um, and as Future has mentioned, we welcome for everyone in the audience to please introduce yourself, um, drop any questions there, and we will try to get to those after we get to, through the panelists' questions. 
And so without further ado, I will introduce our panelists. And so first we have Dr. JT Roan. He is a writer, filmmaker, and assistant professor of African and African-American studies in the School of Social Transformation at Arizona State University. He received his PhD in history from Columbia University, and he is a 2008 graduate of the Carter G. Woodson Institute at the University of Virginia, where he earned his Bachelor of Arts in African and African-American studies. He currently serves as the co-senior editor of Black Perspectives, the digital platform of the African-American Intellectual History Society. Rowan's scholarship essay, Rowan's scholarly essays have appeared in Seoul's journal, the Review of Black Political Economy, and Current Research in Digital History. His work has also appeared in venues such as the Brooklyn Rail, Pacific Standard, The Eminent Frame, and Martyr Shuffle. Roan is a 2020-2021 National Endowment for the Humanities slash Mellon Foundation Research Fellow at the Schomburg Center for Research in Black Culture um, at the New York Public Library. Uh, Dr. JT Roan, welcome, welcome, welcome. Thank you so much. Next, I will introduce Dr. Frances Roberts Gregory. Uh, she is an eco-womanist ethnographer, feminist political ecologist, and future faculty fellow in the School of Public Policy and Urban Affairs at Northeastern University. Frances is also a co-founding and steering committee member of the Feminist Agenda for a Green New Deal, former environmental educator for the Deep South Center for Environmental Justice, advisory board member, member for the High Fund for Climate and Gender Justice, and former resource developer for the New Orleans and C40 Women for Climate Mentorship Program. From 2018 to 2021, Francis taught courses on gender, environmental racism, digital activism, climate justice, and sustainable development at Tulane University, Bard Early College, New Orleans, and the University for Peace in Costa Rica. As a first generation graduate student and descendant of Southern sharecroppers and field hands, Frances is proud to have her undergraduate studies at Spelman College and graduate research at the University of California, Berkeley. Most importantly, Frances looks forward to mentoring the next generation of radical HBCU and feminist ecological leaders. Dr. Frances Roberts Gregory, welcome, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. Hi, everyone. Next, I will introduce Deuce, Dr. Michael K. Dorsey. He is a recognized expert on global energy, environment, and finance and sustainability matters with decades of experience in the for-profit, nonprofit, and government sectors. A graduate of the University of Michigan, Yale, and John Hopkins University, presently Dr. Dorsey is a JV partner in the Indian-based um, panel manufacturer, Bahal Solar, and a limited partner in the Spanish solar um, concern Ibir's son. In fall 2020, Dr. Dorsey was the inaugural Macmillan Scholar in Residence and Global Affiliate in the Gunn Institute for Environment at the University of Vermont. Dr. Dorsey also has a long legacy of exploring, researching, and working to protect biodiversity in the U.S. and abroad. He has solo walked across Yosemite and Adirondack National Parks. As a trained social forester, in 1996, Dorsey began research in Upper Amazon Basin and has worked in the subtropical and tropical forests of Central and South America, as well as the temperate forests in the Pacific Northwest and New England. Beyond his publications, Dr. Dorsey's conservation research has long been in cooperation and collaboration with leading scholars, think tanks, advocacy groups, government, corporations, multilateral agencies, as well as fence line, marginalized and forest communities and many more. Dr. Dorsey, welcome, welcome. It's a pleasure to have you here. Next, I would like to introduce uh, Valencia Gunder. She is the national organizing lead for the Red, Black, and Green Deal for the Movement for Black Lives, and recently moderated the Movement for Black Lives National Climate Impact Call, the impact of climate on Black lives. As an organizer and advocate, she believes that being unsheltered and under-resourced is not only poverty, but also a systemic exclusion from the life of the community. Gunder is a Miami native and grew up in Liberty City. Gunder is the founder of the Smile Trust, an organization that addresses the issues of the unsheltered food and housing insecurities in communities across the South. Gunder also works with organizations such as the Black Collective in pursuit of an equitable Florida for all. Gunder made headlines in the aftermath of Hurricane Irma and Dorian 
when she created the Community Emergency Operations Center, a grassroots people's relief effort during the lead up to the storm. Through this relief effort, through this relief effort, Gunner has been able to assist over 200,000 families in the global south. Valencia, thank you for being here. Welcome, welcome. Hi, everybody. Next up, we have Destiny Hodges. She is an environmental liberation organizer, filmmaker, and junior interdisciplinary communications major at Howard University and from Birmingham, Alabama. H-U. I went to Maryland, so I can't really say that, but I've heard it enough times. <laughs> she is the founder and co-executive director of Generation Green, home to the architects of the environmental liberation ideological framework and movement. Her work is rooted in the belief that climate justice and environmental justice are key components to Black liberation, along with building community and solidarity across the African diaspora to build collective power needed for systems change. As a student of Black liberation movements with a love for journalism and storytelling, Destiny is embarking on a journey of documentary filmmaking as she organizes through the African diaspora. While organizing on Howard University's campus, Destiny and two other students founded the Howard University Student Sustainability Committee as a coalition slash network of students and student organizations dedicated to sustainability and environmental justice on campus, holding the administration accountable and serving the surrounding DMV community. She is also the assistant producer and marketing coordinator for the climate and culture focused podcast, The Coolest Show, presented by the Hip Hop Caucus. Destiny, welcome, welcome. Thank you for being here. Hello, thank you. And last but certainly not least, we have Tamara Tolles O'Loughlin. She is a national climate strategist and environmental advocate focused on people and planet. Her niche in environmental work is developing capacity building programs and creating multimedia campaigns to dismantle privilege and increase opportunities for vulnerable populations to access health, air, clean energy, and a toxic free economy at the local, regional, and national level. Tamara has worked for two decades to embed the principles of environmental justice into environmental work and with attention to community capacity building, mobilization, equity and enforcement, and environmental health. Tamara is a native New Yorker, um, casts a wide net in service to the community. Among her activities, she is the co-chair of the Green Leadership Trust, which builds a more powerful environmental movement by expanding the impact and leadership of people of color and indigenous people serving on US environmental nonprofit boards. She is a member of the World Economic Forum, National Cities Executive Working Group. Tamara also serves as the chairwoman of the board of directors of Women's Voices for the Earth based in Missoula, Montana. Women's Voices disrupts industry standards by, force, by forcing ingredients disclosure and the elimination of toxic chemicals from personal care products. She serves on the advisory board of Climate Power 2020 and is a member of Politico Sustainability Forum, the long game where she provides insight on issues of climate change and social responsibility. Most recently, Tamara was the former National American Director at 350.org, where she drove regional strategy in the United States and Canada. She earned her graduate degrees from the Vermont Law School in 2009 a Juris Doctorate and a Master's of Environmental Law and Policy with a concentration in energy generation and carbon constraint. Uh, Tamara, welcome, welcome. Thank you so much for being here. What a beautiful panel we have here. And so I will kick it off with a question for everyone and um, we'll popcorn and feel free if you feel so moved to answer first or wherever. And so the first question is, how do we cultivate an environment that is conducive to envisioning a future where Black people can thrive? Since we're standing on ceremony, I'll break the ice and, and say, mostly I just do what Dr. Dorsey tells me to do, which is think bigger. Uh, <laughs> I, I usually wanna do something and he's like, here's 17 more people. 55 more ways you need to do it. And so taking that, like my community is a loving one full of people who all want us to win. And so I think some of it is just envisioning that that's true for people other than folks I don't know and then encouraging people to make it bigger. Love that, think big. And also love the Dr. Dorsey reference. He, I can recall him telling me the same thing. He's like, is that all you asked for at the University of Michigan? He's yeah. like, ask for more. 
put some millions behind that number. What are you doing? <laughs> yes, that is real. <laughs> Since y'all calling me out now, I got to step in it. Uh, so, <laughs> you know, I, I think the first priority is demand more. I think the second priority is demand more than the first priority. And I'd say the third priority is demand more than the first two priorities. And why? Uh, so that we don't think that those three priorities in increasing order are hyperbola. Why? Because most will assume as the great Mandela offered or some say he offered is, is whether or not clear he did or didn't, but it seems impossible until it's done. Uh, I think too often uh, we don't put enough zeros in front of the decimal point, as I mentioned to Professor to be Bednar uh, in his request of my former alma mater uh, in getting resources for black students and so forth. Um, but beyond the money request, I think we have to really pitch ourselves out to what seems to be impossible because it is what is impossible apparently that's probably more reasonable. Uh, and we've seen this time and time again in any kind of struggle. Uh, everybody, lots of, uh, I call them the saltine environmentalists. I'll let you all interpret that on your own. Uh, some call them the environmentalists of, of non-color. Um, I'll let you tangle with that in your mind. Uh, are patting themselves on the back because uh, the guy we put in the White House, and let's be clear about we, uh, and not even we really, the sisters put it in the White House. Let's, let's keep it real. The guy that the sisters put in the White House is talking about increasing the emissions reductions by 50%. But as I told folks on Al Jazeera yesterday, and as all of you all know, no doubt in the audience, uh, that anytime the government says it's possible, they're being too conservative and probably double is actually the reality. So, you know, 50% is yesterday's deal, literally, quite literally, he said yesterday. So today's deal is really going to 100 and beyond. And that's the only way we're going to deliver justice uh, for those that have been uh, under the apartheid thumb of low intensity democracy that defines this nation. Um, so we got to demand more as the first priority. We got to demand more than that first priority. And we got to demand more than the first two priorities as the way forward. That's what I offer. Love it. Thank you for that. We need a max out. I, I could jump in. I think, you know, I'm a historian, so I'm approaching this a little slightly differently, but I, I, I agree. And I think part of what we can draw on is the kind of histories of Black communities have known. We didn't need the discourse of climate change to understand that environmental degradation was a reality, right? Slavery, <laughs> the replacement of primal forests and indigenous life ways and modes of living with settler stuff and enslavement and monoculture, that was all a, uh, an echo, what, that was all tied to echo side, right? Um, so I think, you know, we can also excavate those kinds of histories, I think of black, um, black practices um, of community and belonging and what was really otherwise unlivable conditions as a, as a means of thinking about futures. And I think, you know, I think, um, I, yeah, I think that there's a lot that we can do in that avenue. And I think, you know, I think about slave narratives. I think about, like, these are all environmental texts at the end of the day, right? They, are, they truly are. I mean, whether it's the weaponization of the weather that slave masters use, or it's the kind of fugitive practices of feeding yourself out of a commons. Like black communities have known what it means to face ecocide and to survive it and to thrive in it. Um, and I think that's, and I, and I think that, you know, we do, I wanted to just um, comment, riff on the last comment. We have currently faced a, a, a horizon of eco-fascism, right? Because the idea that we're gonna replace and displace carbon with lithium or some other formation and not end colonialism, genocide, slavery, and these kinds of things. So let's be serious. Capitalism has never displaced slavery from the globe, right? 
it only, you know, we could think of major industries, chocolate, shrimp, <clears throat> lithium. We could think of lots of industries that maintain that relation. Cotton still, I mean, hell, most of our clothes are produced by damn near slave labor, right? In, in, the, in the sort of global frame. Um, and I think we already see what that horizon has in store. You know, any, any idea that Europe should lead the way is just foolish anyway. I mean, there, how can, that's like, you know, that's like asking the wolf to, to save the lamb. You know what I mean? Um, I think, you know, I think we saw already with Germany and Bolivia with what's possible with that framework that we're gonna replace carbon with lithium. We're gonna look at, we're gonna see coups around who has, who has rare minerals. That's not, a, that's not transformative and it's not justice. Um, so anyway, I think that, and I think black history is replete with alternatives. <clears throat> wow, that was, thank you one, thank you. That was, that was just so much that you put on the table um, and just even leading with that we, we didn't need the language of, of climate change to, to know what environmental degradation looks like and how capitalism and the enslavement of black and brown people are in, inextricably still connected. Um, and we really need to move towards transformation. Thank you for that. Um, I'll jump in real quick um, because I'm an organizer and I don't have like um, formal education in none of these things. I learned climate through community. I learned environmental injustice through community. Um, and as a person who grew up in Baham, I mean, in Miami, my family's Bahamian and also indigenous to South Florida, um, we've been knowing it for a long time. And um, I was just listening to um, the brother JT before me and um, listening to him and the doctor talk about things and I just remember um, like how these conversations don't get to our people sometimes, but also they do understand, like JT said, like when we were, when I have community meetings and I just ask folks, what do they know about climate change? They may not have the science, they never have the data, but one thing they have is a lived experience and they can tell you like, hey, when I was 15 years old, I could breathe in the summertime. Now I cannot breathe. But let me teach you why you can't breathe, right? Why your water tastes different than 25 years ago and why your house cannot withstand a storm in 2020 that it could withstand in 1996. Um, those are the type of conversations that I enjoy being a part of um, because it makes me think about, um, I've been like stalking um, Leah Penniman from Soul Fire Farms and as she tells the story of our ancestors, how they were sowing like seeds into their hair during um, um, when they were being um, enslaved. And I think about how our communities are fighting for their dear lives, not just to survive, but also to share our stories, to uplift our solutions, to um, share tactics um, with other communities. And um, I think that's like super important. And I think we have to make sure all of those things are a part of our plan because um, when um, we are faced with this um, new climate reality, when these 300 something million folks need to migrate to other parts of the world, um, we are going to have to shift. How do we prepare a place for our people? Um, and that does look like having um, clean solutions, right? Real clean solutions, not the one that includes black death, real clean solutions. And um, also how do we rebuild culture and then tell the stories of our past? Um, I think about those all the time. Oof, you're gonna hop in, Dr. Roberts Gregory. Yeah, I was just gonna say, yeah, I agree with everything that's been said thus far. I would say if we wanna cultivate environments where Black folk um, can thrive, we have to, first of all, love Black folk. <laughs> and love for me is an actual praxis. It's, um, it's rigorous. I think that we also have to uh, make sure that we're making spaces for healing. We have cumulative intergenerational trauma. And so it's hard to thrive when you don't have, um, when you don't heal um, these wounds, these pains, these violences that we will continue to experience. And, that, and if we don't make space for post-traumatic growth. So healing is really important. And then I would say uh, it's also important to think intersectionally because we want all black folks to thrive. So that means we need intersectional futures. We need feminist futures. We need uh, futures that think beyond 
um, global north, global south boundaries, futures that are transnational, um, futures that are diasporic, since we are diasporic people. So that's really important. And then, of course, lifting up the voices of the youth. Youth leadership is so important. Um, and educators are really important, particularly since educators are on the front lines of these uh, intersectional feminist futures. I agree with everything that's been said. Um, so I think I'll kind of approach it in talking about uh, conducive environments in the context of the spaces in which we build community and which we work together, organize and mobilize together. And I think components of that space looks like diasporic organizing, um, like Dr. Robert Gregory just mentioned. It's so crucial that we not only know about, you know, what's going on with our brothers and sisters in different parts of the world, but that we also communicate and build community with one another, understand each other, make connections and agenda set together. So we need spaces where we can set agendas together, um, where we can figure out, you know, okay, what's going on there? What's going on there? What'd you guys do? What was the strategy? I use this strategy. Hmm, let's combine that, you know, let's, let's make something shake considering that we have many shared experiences throughout the diaspora. Um, we also need a space that's conducive to collaborative ideation. So we think about Afrofuturism and actually, you know, using, using our means, using our minds, using our art, our creative expression to, to envision a future. Um, I think many people aren't even ever asked, you know, what does the future look like for Black folks? And then it's like, well, dang, have I thought about that? Um, so I really appreciated the question. And then also I'd like to um, just echo again what everybody else said. It is so important that we have spaces for healing because there's, there's so much trauma. I mean, there's conversations today in my family when I'm trying to learn my family history, they don't even talk about a certain time period and rightfully so. Um, and so we, we need to heal, we need to build community, we need to love one another, we need to love ourselves and we need to know our history through our lens and through our narrative. Um, so a space that, that has all of those components is definitely conducive to securing a future for black folks. Oof, y'all, that was question one. That was question one. And this panel has been dropping gems. I'm hearing love as a rigorous practice, holding space for healing, holding space to, to build a diasporic community, um, how we use the arts and creative expression to, to envision what a future looks like for Black folks. Um, it's got to be intersectional, feminist, uh, transnational, um, and particularly has to, in, if it's an intersectional, that means it also has to um, engage with the youth. Um, so thank you all so much. This is wonderful already. So the next question I have, this one is for Tamara and Valencia. Uh, yesterday, um, the Movement for Black Lives was able to unveil the Red, Black, and Green New Deal. Um, and in that, you know, really uplifting the, the Black climate agenda. And so the question is, can you all tell us what the Black climate agenda is and how a Red, Black, and Green New Deal reflect the values and aims of the Black climate agenda? Sure, I'll, I'll open up the space and I'll also drop um, an article that I just did on musing about it in the public one because you gotta socialize things. It takes a lot of breadcrumbs to get people there. Um, mm -hmm. I wanna flag first and foremost that this is iterative work, it's generative. There will be conflict and that too will be generative. The black climate agenda from where I'm sitting is everything that we must do at this moment to make sure that there are black people in the future. So we were just talking about the Black climate agenda in, in a different frame. Uh, so, and not just so that we're thriving, but that we're surviving. So that includes policy mechanisms. It will include history and story, data collection, organizing, art, and everything that we just talked about. We have to keep being us to make sure we exist in the future, which means to some extent, developing a strategy, a schedule, and an agenda against oppositional actions that are coming towards us in every part of the system. Some of it is just recognizing that the system is not for us. It has never been designed for us. And that this particular system is only as old as our generational memory, our epigenetic memory for it. We have done other things as, as the doctor said previously. So the Black Climate Agenda is our, set, our opportunity to reset the schedule before America 3.0 point oh sets us back once again come on that's a word it feels so much like the it feels so much like the civil war these days if you, if you go out step outside your house the air feels a lot like 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 that that period and it 
you can close your eyes, you can feel it in the air and the water and the grass and how people look at you. And if we are not figuring out how we're going to respond to that, we'll be there again, fighting for basic survival. But I'll, I'll leave some space for Vita to talk about the specific work that we've been doing to craft some open space for people to generate there. Yeah, yeah. Um, thanks, Tamara, comrade. And shout out, we dropped the RBG New Deal yesterday. I dropped the uh, website inside of the chat for y'all to check out. Um, so it's, it's a Black climate agenda. It's not a completed Black climate agenda. So all of the Black people that love climate and knows and have solutions, we welcome you to the space. I always plug. Um, Doc, all the doctors don't hear y'all to begin an email for me after this panel because <laughs> we need all in the space. But um, the RBG New Deal is a um, multi-year, multi-faceted um, Black climate agenda. We are trying to bring Good. the best of, um, of all the Black environmental and climate justice folks into a space um, to help build this thing. Um, and we want to do mass public education to folks around climate how um, it shows up in their communities, helping folks identify the issue, um, like meeting people to the front door. And then also I'm um, inviting folks in to help build solutions. Um, and we are going to do it in the, the most simple terms, but not the most simple way. So we're going to do land, labor, water, energy, economy, and democracy. Now underneath each one of these tabs, I are like, that ain't everything we know. <laughs> but um, like, for example, under land, you got land sovereignty, eminent domain, climate, climate migration, labor. We're talking jobs, healthcare, um, disaster planning, um, water affordability and accessibility, energy, of course, renewable energy, but also public utilities and market-based solutions, um, economy, disaster recovery, because y'all know the government always say they send their money to a state and black folks never see a penny of it. We are trying to change that too. And then um, of course, democracy, voting rights for climate migrants, um, census and re redistricting um, that may impact um, polling places and things of that nature. Um, we are inviting you all to come build this out. This will be a extremely big organizing mechanism. Uh, we also have, I am so sorry y'all because people don't think I work because I'm an organizer. Um, <laughs> Uh, and also um, people, I mean, we, we're going to do organizing and political education. We have this huge, huge communications plan. So we need the artists. We need all of the things. We, of course, we need youth, but even more. Um, and this is where Tamara is leading um, our federal policy, right? Um, how we are not going to stand for any false solutions. Um, one of our um, leaders said, um, if your um, clean energy includes Black death, it's not clean. And like, that's where we at. Like we seen other versions of the new deal of a thing. And you're like, wait a minute, if y'all get this piece, this is going to harm black folks. Or if you do this piece, it's going to harm black folks. We're not doing that with ours. We will not sacrifice a black life um, at the movement for black lives. We defend black lives all the time. And I want to make sure that um, you all help pour into that. So please, please, please reach out. Um, and join that. Um, of course, our good friends at Black and Environment are a part of the space and um, want to make sure more Black people know and understand that we have this and it's a collective process for everybody. Wonderful. Thank you all so much for sharing that. And so really uplifting that this is an iterative process. <clears throat> it takes time and that we have to meet this process with generation. Um, conflict can and will be uh, generative. We want a place where Black folks are thriving, not only surviving, but and surviving. Um, and to meet people where they are to help figure out what their solutions, um, one, like what their problems are, and, and two, like what their active role in designing solutions um, can look like. And, and I love how V mentioned, I think, on the prior question is that Black folks may not have the data, um, but what they do have is the lived experience. And um, I think that helps us just like uplift this notion of just honoring multiple ways of knowing um, and how that too can help inform um, what, what the future can look like. So thank you all. I just want to, uh, I just want to put an asterisk there and say, we do have the data. We are the data. Just want to flag that we, yep. we don't have, we don't have the translations 
but we wrote the codex, right? Like we like, so I just want to flag that like all of this is borrowed from us. There are no things that exist that are not in our bodies that are not of our bodies. And so I just want to pull that out so that we don't fall into the trap. You, I'm about to sound like Fred Moten if I keep talking, but I'm just, I just want you to know that like this thing that we're talking about is a lane inside of a lane that we live our lives in, but the whole thing is ours. The map is not the territory. Mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Thank you so much for, for, for bringing that um, back to the floor because yes, we, we are data. We, we've been able to, to, to mine it and, and use it for our survivability for years. Um, so thank you for that. I love that. Yeah, the map, the map is not our territory. Um, so the next question I have to really build on that is for Dr. Francis Roberts Gregory. Um, what is a feminist approach to the Green New Deal and why is this intersectional approach important? Right. Thank you so much for that um, question. And also, I want to add, there's some folks uh, on our panel who are also members of the Feminist Agenda for a Green New Deal. So I will encourage them to um, speak on this uh, question as well. But really, the Feminist Agenda for a Green New Deal is a radical eco-feminist manifesto of how do we envision um, feminist, intersectional, regenerative futures. And so we have 10 principles. And some of our principles include, of course, requiring intersectional gender analysis because uh, we don't want to make the mistake of equating women with gender. Everyone has gender. We're talking about everyone. Everyone um, is impacted detrimentally by our patriarchal system that is racialized as well. Also recognizing the fallacy of domestic climate policy because uh, our policies are transnational. Some of our speakers already mentioned. Also confronting institutional patriarchy and racism, advancing reproductive justice, uh, and then I would just uh, focus in on rejecting the false solutions that were already mentioned, such as geoengineering, carbon capture, uh, and creating regenerative and feminist economies, such as care economies. And so many of my colleagues have, uh, in this post-pandemic, if you want to call it post-pandemic landscape, pivoted to um, centering care work. And recently, uh, uh, Rihanna Gunright, um, who's the policy architect of the, one of the policy architects of the Green New Deal, um, and her co-author, um, Lenore Palladino, I believe their name is, um, created a, or wrote or authored, I should say, a care and climate brief that really goes into greater detail about how care work has always been gendered and racialized, how we can trace that back to plantation economies and also New Deal policies and how care jobs are green jobs. So I'll leave it there, but yeah, Feminist Agen Agenda for a Green New Deal, definitely check it out. And I encourage some of the other panelists to speak on that as well. Wow. I'm just dropping, I'm dropping the different pieces in the chat. It's a, it's, it is the thing that we need to be doing now. And it is not something we're oppositional against because it's of us, it's from us, it is our community. The idea that feminism is not gendered, that it is not the sad thing that some of these orgs have dragged it to filth doing by failing to inc make it as included, inclusive as we need to. The, just to revert back to the very first question that opened up the panel, the idea is that if it's a big enough idea, we all fit in it. If you have to stop being you to do something, it's not the right work. And so a feminist agenda recognizes that there are no places where we can crush a full half of our being and, be, and move forward in the politic, in the ways that we design our communities, in the ways that we meet out uh, money and resources, capacity and investments. So uh, there are folks on this panel who can talk about all of those pieces in depth, but just wanted to back up uh, Dr. Roberts Gregory by, by saying that the work is already happening. The question is, are we buying into it? Or are we getting bought off by it? Wow, love that. And, and if you should hear what the quotes, if, if you have to stop being you, it's not the right work. So I love this, truly this embrace of our whole humanity and our, our multiple identities of, of who we really are. Um, so thank you all for that. Uh, the next question I have, and it's for Dr. JT Rome, but I think also Francis might be able to chime in and, and maybe some other folks. Um, what is the a Black ecology's framework and how can it inform how we navigate the present and how we might explore the future? Thank you. Um, Justin Holsby, who's an anthropologist at Emory and I have been thinking of, through Black ecologies. And of course, we really draw on Nathan Hare's 70 essay and a Black scholar talking about Black ecology as housing and food and all of the other kinds of things around Black life. Tonight, you know, in response to the kind of, um, you know, kind of 
uh, environmentalism that is emerging in that period that, again, you know, wanted to focus on ecology and as something out there beyond human life or relations as some kind of, you know, and, and totally uncritically, of course, you know, embracing conservationism that's tied to colonial management rather than liberation or decolonization or sovereignty or any of those kinds of things. So we, you know, we use Black ecology to think about the kind of long and enduring histories of Black exposure, uh, you know, from plantation and this, the Middle Passage and all of that, or even in the West African context, the kind of um, state formations that, um, that create deforestation that are tied to European um, infiltration through the slave trade. Um, you know, these are, you know, the whole Atlantic ecology is transformed. So, I mean, putting Black folks at, first of all, at the scene, the ri originary scene and the ongoing scenes of ecocide, um, but also trying to recognize and appreciate the, the multiplicity of Black cultural resources and histories um, for thinking practically and, you know, dr in a dream kind of horizon about what's possible. Um, and I think, you know, um, I'm drawn and I'm sharing somewhat very nervously a uh, film with y'all later, but that's, um, that's based on a slave narrative with a woman in, in Virginia named Minnie Fultz, um, who was interviewed in 37, um, was enslaved in Chesterfield, Virginia. And, you know, after recalling lots of violence and also the, the threat, the constant persistent threat of, um, of her siblings or anybody that she loved being sold to the deep south, she says um, in the slave narrative, like the, this cruelty makes her hope that the waters rise again and that they drown white folks, right? And I think, you know, that kind of, I'm interested in what that kind of imaginary, how we can incorporate those kinds of imaginaries, incantations um, and possibilities along with, you know, histories of fishing and black gardening and all of that. So hopefully that, you know, I think, so again, to just sum it up, Black ecologies is this kind of um, this kind of dialectic, and I think um, you know emphasis on all of what you all are doing. You know, all of the kinds of imaginative work that you all are doing um, with feminist agenda for the Green New Deal. You know, a black, a red, black, and green New Deal. I'm trying to draw out black use Black ecologies to draw out the histories that can inform those kinds of processes and projects and organizing and collectives, so. Wow, thank you so much. And Dr. Roberts Gregory, you have anything to add to that? I mean, I think Dr. Rohn uh, stated it uh, beautifully, particularly with that historical uh, perspective. I mean, I would just add that uh, Black colleges, and I guess my work focuses more on Black feminist colleges, I mean, they're everything we're talking about today. They're disruptive, they're radical, they're heterogeneous, they're spiritual, um, they're joyful. So I think uh, it's really interesting to think of the uh, Black ecologies as an interdisciplinary um, dialectic and folk who haven't always traditionally labeled themselves or been seen as um, ecologists or environmentalists have always been engaged in these conversations. Uh, so yeah, I'm just really excited to see this uh, conversation grow uh, and all the different tributaries that contribute to it. Wonderful, thank you so much for, for contributing that. Uh, so I wanna pivot um, to ask Dr. Dorsey a question. Um, so I remember a talk that you had gave back maybe some years ago in, in CES at um, U of M and you described the importance of um, we needing to get into the political economy of energy. Can you help tell us a bit more about like what that is and, and why is that important for the future? Absolutely, no, thank you for that question, uh, Dominic. So right now we stand at an inflection point. Uh, we crossed it, uh, perhaps few uh, observed it or, or realized it happened uh, just a few months ago indeed. Uh, the, the end of 2020, we came into the period in history where the generation of electricity and power and energy uh, is cheapest uh, from renewable sources, uh, the wind, the water, the sun, than from 20th century fossil foolishness uh, and the fossil foolery of the 20th century. 
So we will never return to that point where the generation of energy and power uh, would be cheaper coming from the fossil foolishness of the 20th century. Now in the 21st century, we sit at a point where we can generate uh, energy and power and keep the lights on uh, with what is clean, green, and meaningful to lives and livelihoods. Uh, that's important, not just because of the absolute upside, because it's clean, green, and meaningful and important to livelihoods. That's also important because that inflection point, that change, is going to see a sea change in the way in which um, large companies, utilities uh, in all of our states, uh, in, in, in all of the countries, uh, deal with parsing out energy and offering up energy, and indeed trying to uh, in, in capture and enclose free assets, uh, the assets of the sun, the assets of the wind, free assets. These companies want to make you basically rent what is free forever. So we are in a domain where we can have a change in conversation about who is going to see the upsides from that new reality, the renewable energy reality. And it's a conversation that we aren't having at a robust enough level right now um, it is what makes the upside of the Green New Deal possible. It's what actually enables us to pay off and move resources uh, out of the, 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 the returns from that clean, green uh, you know, energy into things like education, into things like healthcare and so forth and so on. But if we aren't tuned into that political economic reality, uh, that will have huge downside implications on our communities because already... Uh, black and brown communities pay a disproportionate amount of their income to keep the lights on, to keep energy flowing, to keep um, basic services uh, being delivered. Uh, and indeed, uh, many uh, of our folks, uh, brothers and sisters in Indian country, are still living under what can only be characterized as uh, sustained apartheid. 30, 40% of those uh, Native American brothers and sisters right now living without electricity, living without uh, uh, energy. Uh, living without uh, running water. Uh, that is absolute uh, apartheid. So we have the capacity going forward uh, to change this. And we have the capacity to do so in a way that we have to dial into the political economy. Few uh, wave the flag, um, and I love to wave it because few of my compatriots in Sunrise often raise it. We stood up Sunrise to challenge the last uh, and first black president because he wasn't delivering at scale. Um, now, not all like to say that. That's a point of fact. Uh, he wasn't doing what needed to be done to get us out of the unfolding climate crisis. That's why we stood that up. Uh, the point is, is that we got to lean into the political economy because uh, if we don't, we'll see a scenario where uh, the uh, old energy uh, is transitioning. And by that, I mean old oil and gas is coming into renewables. They're, they're the, the, the newest entrance into this because they see the financial um, upsides of this. They're moving into the space very, very rapidly. They want to keep the benefits. They want to privatize the benefits completely and socialize as much harm as they can. They want to maintain the old framework. The old framework was one where they basically harmed as many of us as they could. So if we're not tuned into the political economic realities and upsides, there will be sustained downsides for black communities in particular, sustained downsides for those on the margins of society. So we've got to pay attention to that. So we give a nod to the current president in his executive order 14008, where he spells out uh, the Justice 40 initiative, where he's you know, making the case that 40% you know, of the upsides of the Green New Deal ostensibly should go to communities. But the reality is, is we give the nod on that, and that's certainly a positive that, that, that he's embraced that vernacular. We're going to have to hold those accountable to make sure that that is indeed delivered. And actually, much more can be delivered. Because you remember what I said at the outset is whenever the government is saying it, usually we can do two to three times better because uh, they're erring on the side of caution and conservatism. And we can do much, much more for our communities that have been the subject of sustained violence, sustained oppression, sustained internal domestic imperialism and colonialism. Oh, thank you. Thank you so much. That was that was wonderful. What I'm hearing is that, of course, we have the capacity to change this. We need to go through a complete system transformation that just honors how cheap clean energy is and, you know, can be. 
Um, and how do we free up the assets? The assets are already there. And so moving away from privatization um, and thinking about how we can deliver justice that obviously complements this J40 agenda, um, but how, how might we surpass that? Um, also a, a shout out to Jackie Patterson at the NAACP with the um, fossil foolery report 2.0 that just dropped on um, April Fool's Day. Um, because indeed, like we know we don't need to be using um, that type of fuel and, and shout out tomorrow for the, the background that just demonstrates that um, folks and black folks are particularly still experiencing pollution. Um, so to, to pivot um, and, and maybe actually to, to, to build on this, I wanted to ask a, a question for tomorrow, if you can um, maybe tell us a bit more about what are climate reparations and how they can energize that future. You're still muted right now. Yes, I think I can. Um, <laughs> Thank you. So, so what I'll, I'll so I'll, I'll give you the the definition and a little bit of background. So, climate reparations is an effort to address the harm caused by past emissions of major polluters. We're in the fourth industrial revolution, so we're trying to improve the lives of vulnerable people. Read black people through programs, policies, and mechanisms that resource the transfers of wealth that will have to happen to make sure we exist in the future. So that's about black lives, black life and black livelihood. Climate reparations explicitly connects generation and concentration of wealth to the concentration of harm in our community and starts to open up a dialogue, a public one, an international one about how we compensate people and bring care and repair into the economic frame to address it. So there are a couple of really smart folks who have been thinking about this for a while. Uh, Max, uh, there's a professor uh, who wrote an article in 2009, Maxine Burkett, that defined the term climate reparations, even though like every idea it was in the air and people were feeling it. Uh, her partner in work, Sonia Klinsky, really took the loss and damage framework to a place where they started to imagine the five-fold versions of how we deal with it. Sandy Darity owns a piece of it in thinking about how we have to acknowledge the harm, we have to do repair work, and then the care comes as a result of that. And as a campaigner, organizer, and strategist, I've been holding the space to try to bring all that academia into an, a muscle that we can use to punch this conversation around how, why we are being asked to pay for everything when we are everything. How do we move the money that needs to be moved and the resources so that we will be in the future? Because everybody else's plan is full of uh, seawalls, black death, and, and, and uh, people starving in a desert that used to be the ocean. So there's a lot to say about climate reparations, but the crux and meat of it is that the concentration of harm is tied to the concentration of wealth. And if we don't deal with both, we're not gonna solve any problems. This conversation is happening globally as loss and damage. So it also provides a real opportunity for us to connect to our family in the rest of the world who is fighting to stop being under the boot of capitalist colonialist debt. And, and one of the things that I uh, probably ruined my next job line chances by tweeting about all the last two days, uh, which was, was the idea that the World Bank, the IMF could just in fact decide to forgive all the debt as a form of reparations, because at some point we're already too far in the negative to hand anybody a check that will cover the problems. So lots to say about that. That is a whole webinar it is work there are podcasts i will try to put them in the chat oh thank you so much for that and maybe a follow-up and maybe dr dorsey can chime in on this as well um how might we be able to like direct those investments and, and cultivate um business development for the black community that think about um just our changing climate but also you know just navigating the future so there's so so many ways to 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 do just that thing, and and many of them are already unfolding. Uh, you know, me and several colleagues, we've been spending the past couple quarters now standing up something called Black Owners of Solar Services. Uh, so so that is indeed the name. I think says it all. Uh, you've got a whole wealth of, as the name says, Black Owners of Solar Services. Uh, it's not only limited to solar. Certainly, you've got. We, we didn't stand it up, but you certainly have black owners of renewable services as well. Uh, and that are, you know, black owned businesses that are delivering and playing a role both on the labor side, but also on the investment and the finance and the capital side in delivering uh, the 
the, the sort of the bona fides of the Green New Deal, as it were, by putting literally infrastructure in the ground uh, and then and, and, and more, certainly. So there's certainly that, that path of, of black businesses uh, that are delivering in, in this space. There's also, I think, the space of looking at how we set up rules and regulations, the governance space, as it were. Um, we've got a lot of utilities right now in many jurisdictions, certainly where you're sitting right now, Dominic, in Michigan with DTE and Consumers Power and in many other states for that matter outside Michigan, beyond Michigan, that are actively standing in the way of delivering on the true upsides of renewable economy. They're engaging in a blockade of clean, green energy that is meaningful and pertinent to the lives of black people and the lives of, of all people for that matter. So we've got to do things to check that uh, you know, intransigence of basically utility oligarchies and so forth. So that, that can happen in the public policy domain. We also have an opportunity, I think, on the, the philanthropic side as well, you know, outside of you know, private equity and institutional capital outside of governance on the philanthropic side to catalyze and play a role in driving some of these changes, whether it's in funding organizations on the advocacy side, whether it's in backing uh, some of the smaller investments that aren't always attractive to large money on the institutional investment side. So you have a panoply of, of activities that are actually playing out right now. Those things can be supercharged and need to be you know, built up better and, and energized and that's happened and that needs to happen more. Incredible. So definitely a, a strong focus on infrastructure policy, but also to, to lean into what the philanthropic side can, can help us with this. Thank you for that. And so our next question I have for Destiny, um, you are the, the founder of Generation Green. We want to know if you can tell us a bit more about that. Um, and then specifically, if you can um, just share more about the vitality of what youth climate engagement um, means and why it matters. Of course. Um, so I think it's, it's important to first start off with the reality of Black youth doing climate work or in this mainstream climate and environmental movement. Um, we know the realities of the climate and environmental movement in general, right? It's racist, it's based in eugenics. In many cases, um, a lot of these huge, big green, as we call them, organizations are hoarding funding. Um, they're treating their employees, particularly black employees, but also people of color like crap. Um, and they don't care. And they, they use them up in the context of having folks do things outside of their job descriptions, you know, dealing with the racist boss, so on and, and so forth. Um, not being able to unionize until recently, it, it's a long list. And so I think in, in the years recently, as we've seen the youth climate movement emerge, um, people are really, really quick to, to just lift everybody up like, oh my God, look at the youth, look at the youth. But what is going on with black youth in these youth spaces as well? And I feel like that's not a conversation that's talked about enough because like we, I'm not gonna name any organizations, but there's plenty of these um, youth led organizations who are invited into all of these spaces um, who are given all of this money and who are uplifted. Yes, we should uplift the youth and, and fund the youth and bring them into spaces. But if those spaces that the youth movement and organizations creating are harmful to black folks and to black youth, then I have questions. Um, we, we have beef and that needs to be addressed and the money needs to stop going there and the visibility needs to stop going there too. And so this is the reality of, of black youth in this movement. Not only are we a, not able to really function in these large big greens. I mean, what person of color really is in a, in a safe way, in a meaningful way, um, and, and in our, rooted in our identity. And then, you know, we go to the youth climate movement, just as bad, um, if not worse, because many of us are still becoming people. I'm not saying that's an excuse, but it, it's, it's a lot of, you know, yeah. And then on top of that, in many cases, we don't feel embraced by some of our elders um, who are black and who do some of this environmental work as well, because there's a lot of gatekeeping. So it, it's being black and young in this work is, it can be very traumatizing. It can be very hard and it can feel very alone because environmentalism in general is, you know, shown as a white thing. It's whitewashed. So there's that too. Um, and so for many of us, our introductions into environment and environmental justice, et cetera, is only through these whitewashed spaces. And then we try to reach out and it's, it's very, yeah. So that's the reality of black youth first. Um, the importance of black youth 
work in this movement and supporting Black youth in general is what good is any movement without youth? You know, we've seen that time and time again. What good is any movement if you can't pass the blueprint on to the youth? What good is any movement if you don't have youth leading? And we've seen that historically over many movements. Um, and so youth are the future. You know, we're, we're fighting for our future too. We're fighting for our lives right now, all of us. Um, and youth, we're fighting for our future. And so in the context of Generation Green, um, Generation Green, I started the organization um, along with the founding team of other dope Black folks who are HBCU graduates and students. Um, after experiencing basically what I just described as a Black youth and um, as a young Black person in the space, but it didn't take me long. I was like, oh no, <laughs> I refuse to be in this any longer. And I refuse to see other Black folks have to go through this, especially Black youth when it's already a limited amount of us in the space. So grabbed up some folks that I met in organizing on Howard's campus and at the HBCU Climate Change Conference, shout out to them, and was like, hey, let's make a space for Black youth um, in, this, in this work of environment and discovering what that means to us. And as time evolved, um, Generation Green has now turned into an ecosystem that strives to foster an intergenerational network, community, and platform that fortifies youth leadership in the environmental liberation movement throughout the African diaspora. Now, for folks who have not heard environmental liberation before, that's okay. Um, Generation Green, we are the, the architects of this ideological framework and movement. And this focuses on really claiming a decolonized, regenerative, and autonomous future for Black folks. So this means that, you know, when we think about the injustices and the environments, the Black experience, which is what we're really focusing on analyzing um, and addressing, how do we define environment? And I think it's really important that we refer to the EJ definition of environment, which really includes the complex interaction of the social, the physical, the biological, the political, economic, so on and so forth. It's, it's the complex interaction of everything that surrounds us and encompasses us, which means that our body, our Black bodies are also an environment. So when we start having these conversations about, you know, environment and climate, it's like, well, what are you, what are you referencing? What are you defining? What is, what is in that? And so it's really different when we have a conversation in the mainstream environmental movement about what environment is. And when we have a conversation about environment in that lane of understanding that my body is an environment that is poisoned every day by the water I drink, the food I eat, the air I breathe, you know, so on and so forth. Um, and so environmental liberation critically analyzes the injustices in the environments of the Black experience that stem from colonialism, global racial capitalism, white supremacy, et cetera, et cetera. And it seeks to return Black folks around the world to their ancestral connection and relationship to the earth. So it's formed by Black folks. You know, solidarity, allyship is welcome when it's instructed um, and, and when resources are redistributed, but this is for and by Black folks. This is a movement for us. Um, and it's, it's decolonial and border thinking as well. So it's not just a United States thing. It's not just a national thing. This is for Black folks everywhere across the diaspora as we are Africans. Um, and so it's a historical analysis as well that I touched on, meaning that we have to acknowledge the history of global racial capitalism since that's the system that we operate in, which includes not only you know, the transatlantic slave trade, but the Arab and Indian ocean slave trade, which is still going on to this day to our brothers and sisters in Libya, Morocco, et cetera. Um, and it is so important for youth to be centered in this work, again, because what is a movement without youth? And it transcends systems. So it radicalizes us to, to think you know, beyond just operating where we are, but noting that there's a need for transformational, existential, and holistic change. So when we think about what is justice and what is liberation, I feel like many times people conflate the two um, or they, you know, they, they mean one, but they say the other. Um, and I guess in just hearing some of the words in here, I think justice can be really a Band-Aid over harm. So why put a Band-Aid over harm when you could dismantle the entire system so that harm does not exist anymore? Or that you and your community are able to control and, and decide what addressing the harm looks like and not have to depend on a neoliberal state per se or anyone to direct and distribute band-aids for your harm. Um, so in summary, I said a lot, but that is Generation Green. That is the work that we do. We are for and by black folks and we're focused on liberating our people and understanding the connections between land, climate, place, environment and more in our process of doing that. Oof. 
Okay, come on, Destiny. Thank you, thank you. That, that was a whole sermon right there. Um, wow, see, th this is why, why having uh, Black youth is, is so important. Just like you get these perspectives, you get this, th this energy and, and, and the power, just how we can completely um, interweave all these different perspectives and, and how we might try to path forward. I got a question that I think is coming up from this and someone typed it into the chat, but that is a little off script, but this, I'm gonna pose this to the whole group. Um, Valencia said abolition is the only answer. Uh, I wanna know if you can speak a, a, a bit more about you know, the, just the role of abolition and the climate movement. I think a lot of people don't immediately might not be able to make the connections between abolition and in a, in a just and equitable climate future. So. Um, yeah, if you want to spark us off for that, please. Absolutely. Um, well, abolition is the answer to all the things that we're fighting <laughs> against, um, to name that. Um, it's no way that you can um, fix or try to build solutions in a broken system. The system needs to be completely dismantled, and we need to reimagine what our society looks like outside of these systems, patriarchy, white supremacy, capitalism, um, oppression, racism, all the things, mass incarceration, throw it all in the trash, right? Um, I also think about abolition comes in steps. It comes in steps. I think sometimes when people are like, yeah, defund the police, because I'm about that. It's F12 forever, period. However, I do understand that we have to get our people there, right? We have to get our people to the point that they start to believe um, that they can live outside of these social constructs that we have been in for generations, right? Um, I think that that takes a lot of organizing work. It takes a lot of education. It takes a lot of different types of solutions, solutions to get us steps to the, to the abolition. Um, it, it will not happen overnight. It will not happen overnight. And honestly, y'all, even us as black people in these colonized um, lands of the United States, we, um, we literally will have to sacrifice in abolition. And I think that's what scares folks. That's what scares folks. I, I'm just preparing myself like, be what would you have to give up? What do you have to give up as a American, an English speaker, as a person who has a birth certificate, as a person who has a job and brings in an income, as a cisgender woman? Like how, what do I need to give up to create space for all of us to be included? And I think that's the real abolition. And um, we think about that in the climate context, right? One, it's no, um, uh, I just hate like my skin like uh, crawls when I hear about like, yeah, we're gonna find the oil companies. You could just stop them from goddamn digging up the oil. Like that's, <laughs> y'all get what I'm saying? Like, that's what I believe Destiny was saying and everybody else on this call, like it's time. It is time, like stop calling, calling it what it ain't. We just need to stop. We need to stop in America. Don't, y'all don't let America fool y'all. In 1950, the United States government stopped all production of all cars in this country to build out its military. If we want it to cor correct, the government could do a thing. They just don't want to because they're greedy and they want black people to die, right? And that's why when we build our solutions, when you hear all the folks on this um, panel talking, you're hearing us talking about new solutions, right? The bigger thing, asking for more, like if um, what the doctor said, if you acted for something, that means it's too short, we need more of it. And that's the framework of abolition. And I also think abolition is never being, um, being full, never being um, satisfied, right? Um, our ancestors, um, I'm quite sure when the um, EJ movement was built out of and grew out of the environmental, I mean, the civil rights movement, um, they wouldn't have probably even been talking about the things we talking about. They would have dared not <laughs> do the thing, but we are our ancestors' wildest dreams. And if we can move the needle, which we will, imagine what our grandbaby's gonna be doing. Breathing, that's what they're gonna be doing. So yeah, I'm gonna check, cause I get all preachy, but. Can I say something too about this question about abolition? Thank you so much. That was, Valencia, that was popping. I wanted to say, I wanted to draw the parallel out between the current oil uh, moguls and fossil fuel moguls and sugar planters and suggest that in the ways that sugar was interrupted and disrupted by the Haitian revolution, that's the scale of, of world 
um, world making that we are, that we're tasked with. Um, the sugar plant, if you read, I mean, I've, this came off teaching Eric Williams, uh, you know, to students and really just sitting and resting with, you could literally almost take sugar planters and dates out of that and put oil moguls. They fund the most backward shit. They funded policing. They funded all of that. I mean, the oil, the oil people is funding all of that shit. So I think um, once you start to do abolition around um, as a kind of radical uprooting and the kind of projection of a new horizon, I, again, I want to just underscore that we're at um, we're at the question of or the kind of uh, leverage point that that enslaved people in Saint Domingue were with sugar plants. Thank you for that contribution, JT. Wow. Dr. Can Darcy, I offer, can I offer a little bit of provocation and just flag that one of the things that Valencia laced in her in her really tight like synopsis of, of abolition is is that we will have to give up things. And so what we are up against is not just other people's opinion of how we are, but how we have adjusted to the very small, narrow window that we have made our whole lives in. Uh, I, I say this as somebody who has tried to organize people in Ivy City by in, in Washington, DC, and saying that I, we don't wanna leave this land, we're being gentrified. And like, well, one, this is not our land. Two, it is killing us. And the fact that everyone you know died 30 years before they were meant to is not a sign that this is your land. So like, I just wanna flag that we get into false fights with our indigenous family about where we come from and abolition has to go all the way there our history is tied to being brought from west africa to this place this place is a fiction on top of another place and there are other people and so if anybody ever tells you we're in a fight against other people indigeneity is about where you are your life relationship to the land not the grouping that you are in and so we really have to go all the way there it's why reparations land back these are not things that are in competition because our history is tied to the thing that exists not all the history that there is and I also want to flag that uh, um, Destiny said a thing that made my heart hurt which she and I have talked about so I'm not bringing this on her at this moment but the idea that like the conceptualization of how children are used in the climate space to do this work is a deeper darker discussion than, than we can have in this moment about how old white men choose young white women to do to do to do their labor and our community doesn't work that way we are multi-generational that diasporic organizing that we were talking about is down at the core of this work that too is a thing that we have to get back to because it isn't about whether the elderly or the elders or the youth will save us energy needs wisdom the real work is in recognizing that our natural environment is multi-generational that we have to abolish the idea that a lone wolf does anything that is not our way of working and I, and I also just want to lift up that um, when I as a part of my previous work, my job was to cultivate people to mobilize them in the street by the millions, right? So what I'm telling you is when people ask me where are the black people, I said, well, we don't put our vulnerable people up front. That's so if you want to organize with us, you have to get through the people who we are holding out and who are strong in order to protect those of us who need support. So if we are protecting our future and our history, you can't get to old black people or young black people to organize with you unless you get with the rest of us that are in the middle of the seesaw because we willing to go in whatever direction is best for our people. So I just wanted to flag that like, even that framing around how we organize is gonna be a thing that goes to the wayside when we start to let go of other people handing us narratives about how we organize. This is our stuff. They sing in our songs. Uh, there's an organizer in Baltimore who says, uh, when you hear the magic words without the magic people, it doesn't sound like magic. So some of why this work has not rescued us from the things that are that we can do pretty easily. We can solve climate change in two seconds if we stop fighting racism. So like the so just flagging that like one thing is holding on to the other, and we and like we need more conversations like these to lay out what it would mean for us to give up our relationship to this thing, which is an idea on our way to abolition. You know, I was gonna add in that this we we tricked by the dominant dogma to believe incorrectly that there's never enough for those who are sensitively have nothing and there's always enough for those who have everything 
Um, and, and that dominant dogma, that lie, and to put, it, put a very clear, fine point on it, just over a decade ago, under that dogma, under that lie, we've been told we can't feed everybody on earth. There's not enough money to feed everybody on earth. And so on, we can't clothe everybody, we can't house everybody, we can't give people good housing and so forth. But just on the food part, just feeding people. 10 years ago, when the economy of the world collapsed, out of thin air, they managed to find, depending on whose math you believe, 15 to $20 trillion out of thin air. That same time, the UN was saying that we needed roughly about $30 billion a year to feed everybody that weren't getting food. When you divide the 30 billion into that 17 trillion, if we take the average of that 15 to 20, depending on whose math you believe, you get 600 years, actually 566 if you're doing the math with me, of feeding everybody on earth. You get a millennia of ending hunger. So there's a lie that there is never enough for those who have nothing and always enough for those who have everything. And that's a dogma that we've got to get out of because when we come into this new epoch of renewable energy, which we're already in, that lie does not apply in real terms, in terms that we can really measure, in terms that we can track. So if we're trapped under that lie, that, that falsehood, then that's gonna hinder us immensely. And we've got to definitely break rank with that, that nonsense. Wow. Yes, yes, yes. Definitely, we need to move away from the, these notions of like independence, scarcity, deficit, and, and move towards community abundance, asset-based frameworks to, to really help and envision what, what, what this looks like. Um, wow, this has been incredible. Y'all are, y'all are top-notch. This conversation has been absolutely wonderful. Um, we've got about 11 minutes left. And so definitely want to hold some space for if we do have any audience questions, um, please. I think we did have one, but I think Tamara was on it in the chat. Um, but I have maybe like a closing question and maybe if y'all can limit your responses to about 30 seconds, plus or minus. And, and the question is, what do you wish for black folks to know right now that will arm us for the future? So I guess I can start. Uh, so I want Black folk to know that we are um, all connected. I think that when we talk about our history um, as diasporic folk, but also in the US context folk who were kidnapped and um, transported to um, what indigenous folk call Turtle Island, um, our bodies have, and our, 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 our emotional labor, our creativity, our brilliance has been extracted. And so there, we live in this culture of extraction, cultures of addiction, cultures of domination. So we really have to get away from this objectification of nature, but also objectification of each other and, our, and ourselves and recognize that we deserve um, pleasure, joy, healing, uh, luxury. And also that um, our, our, our liber liberatory futures will be wild. They will be playful they will be queer and they will be fugitive. So that's what I would add. Thank you for that. That was beautiful. Dr. Dorsey, I'm muted. You know, for me, it goes back to where we began. You know, the only demand that's reasonable is the impossible demand. So if we're gonna be making demands they have to be reasonable and thus impossible. We can't lay down anything that is acceptable. We can't lay down anything that is within bounds. We have to really make those seemingly impossible demands because for our community, I would say, those are the only reasonable demands to be made. Uh, it, it's, some people will clown you, uh, like that former Senator, former president sitting in Chicago, uh, talking nonsense about uh, how it doesn't make sense about getting rid of the police. Well, they haven't been around since the beginning of time, last I checked, as, as, as Dr. Rome oh. would tell us. Um, so they will clown you by, by you know, shuffling and jiving with, with basketball players, 
you know, from Cleveland and now in Los Angeles, uh, talking on, on chat shows and, and trick you to think that the reasonable demand is indeed impossible when the only demands we ought to be making are those that are impossible because that's where we got to put the, the goalpost. That's where we got to put our ambition out on the horizon. Nothing less is acceptable. Yes, thank you, thank you. Can you, can you lift up the question again, please? The question was, what do you wish for Black folks to know right now that will arm us for the future? Uh, I can I can say very quickly, because I'm from New York and my people talk fast. Um, that <laughs> that that uh, we can't do this alone. The the arc the arc that we are reaching for is very heavy. It requires everyone, and this is not a luxury. Climate is not a luxury. What it evolved out of environment is not a luxury. Our relationship to the planet is not a luxury. Do not be fooled. There are no jobs on a dead planet. There are no degrees on a dead planet. There are no awesome cars on a dead planet. Or if they are, there's nobody to enjoy them. So this work does not belong to other people. It is our work. And if you don't get in it, you will be under it. They are building seawalls. They are making, we one in four of us will be climate refugees. That is real. If we're not already running from floods or fire or death, we will. And so that if you allow other people to dictate the terms in this moment, I think one of the most interesting things that Dr. Dorsey said, which is a true fact that people ignore all the time, is that we are in the middle of the industrial revolution. A whole nother thing is coming. That time when you read about it, what was it like before they had the phone or railroad? This is that moment. And if we show up in energy conversation like consumers instead of owners, we will continue to pay for our oppression twice plus tax. That part, the plus tax. We are living through an industrial revolution. Valencia? Yeah, um, I just think about um, our innovation. One, I wanna name that a part of our reparations is black people getting their goddamn time back so that we can build solutions, that's one. Um, but also the fact that um, our community solutions can be scaled, y'all. Like I think sometimes our people build things in the hood or in their classrooms and some folks just do not re um, realize that, hey, if I put more thought into this to partner with some folks that it'll work. I want um, I want to leave y'all with this, like lean into community solutions. Um, I built community solutions a few times um, and I've been able to help not just the Southern states in America, but also the global South, right? I assist black nations because there are some here on this side of the um, globe. And I think about how we, um, in, especially in the time of disaster, how we have to lean on our oppressors to come help us. Y'all, these people gonna leave us on this planet after they mess it up. What are we going to do? What are we going to do? And I want you to just think, think about that. Like, seriously, not like, oh, flying cars and all the things, even though I believe Black folks know how to build those things, but for real, for real. When it's time for us to, um, to restore this earth, what are we going to do? What does it look like in your community right there in your front door? What can you do in your house right now to slow down this process or to shift the way you move so that you could be prepared for this new climate reality. It is time to start thinking about it. Um, if we like it or not, it is time for us to start preparing for it. It snowed in Mississippi in 2021. I don't know if folks didn't believe about climate change before then, but <laughs> I think people are believing it now, like it's a real thing. So just think about those solutions that happen. Like we, like um, the doctor said, like people been before us um, have did this thing. I think about after the hurricanes, how we pull out our grills and we feed the neighborhood and we do these things. Um, let's think about those solutions. We already have them. Our survival is solutions. I would just piggyback off that and just, oh, sorry, I didn't mean, oh, oh okay. Um, I would just piggyback off that and just say like we have, we have our histories replete with the kinds of things, the um, intellectual, epistemological, practical resources that we truly, truly need. Um, and that that's a that's also um, uh, asking us to reimagine what we think we know about our past through that framework and through that formula to really you know I mean there have been June Jordan was an environmental planner I mean you know I could just go on and on um, like 
Haitian revolutionaries were environmental justice warriors. Like we have to really reimagine how our history has unfolded in relation to what they want to just flatten as the Anthropocene. We have, and 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 we, and I think that's all of our kind of um, it's all of our kind of birthright to 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 relish in that to relish in the reality that we are that we're complete and that we have that history of um, of an alternative and an otherwise embedded as some people have already said within us. Well, I think Dr. Rowan just said a lot of what I was going to say. <laughs> so I guess to, to be brief, to be brief, I want Black folks to know that revolutions are possible and have happened um, in many places, in many Black geographies. We're talking about Haiti. What about Algeria? What about Ghana? The list goes on and on and on and on. Um, and that we must, again, I think I said it earlier on, know our history through our perspective and through our lens. Um, that is so crucial. The revolutionary studies, as Malcolm X and Kwame Ture have said, and it's so important to, to know yourself, to know us as Black folks as a community, and not only know that through a white lens, a white narrative, a white rewriting and erasure of us, but through us, again, our experiences, our oral traditions and histories, the Black radical tradition, what is that? What does that look like? You know, um, how, have we, how have we overcome before? And that doesn't only mean looking solely to the civil rights movement, which we should look to the civil rights movement, but that means knowing more and knowing beyond that. And when you know more and you know beyond that, you're able to imagine more. You're able to see, oh, we did this, this and that. Why nobody tell me about that? I mean, we know why they don't tell us about that, but being able to, to know and understand that revolution is possible, revolution has happened, revolution will happen, and that we must know ourselves um, and, and know our history through our lens. Wow, wow, wow. This is, uh, wow, so, so beautiful. We've got about a minute left. So I want to try to uh, close out here and, um, you know, really honor, as V always says, uh, part of reparations and giving Black people back their time. Um, and so I want to kind of maybe take a twist on one of the audience questions um, and get a one word response from the panelists. If we can do a rapid fire. Um, and the question was, uh, what are your opinions on what luxuries that everyone must give up for a future that is sustainable, safe, and equitable for everyone? And so if you can distill that down to maybe one word, and then that collective one word from all the panelists will hopefully answer that question. Individualism. Ooh. I would say fear. Plastic, plastic, plastic. It goes everywhere. Look in your house. It's even in your body, depending on what kind of night it is. Just flagging for you. Plastic. Avarice. Mm -hmm. White supremacy. Because Black people love that. <laughs> I don't know. <laughs> I can't do the one word thing. I don't know. <laughs> I really don't know. Ooh. Well, all righty. Well, thank you all so much for, for your time. Um, maybe if the audience can help give a round of applause. This was such an incredible, incredible panel. Y'all could have been anywhere in the world um, on a Friday evening, morning, or afternoon, and you all chose to be here with us. And so for that, we are absolutely grateful for your time, your engagement. Um, and ultimately the, the energy that, that you all have. And so with that, um, thank you again. Uh, maybe I wanna pass it over to JT. Um, JT, are you okay with, with sharing, with streaming the video just so we can stay on time? And if not, I, I think I can do it as well. I can, yeah. Just to say okay. a little thing about it real quick. You know, I'm a little nervous about this. This is experimental. Um, just working through trying to activate in my own hometown and tap in in Virginia, like the histories of our capacity to conjure new possibilities. I'll just say that and then I'll share. And again, oh, I, I have to, um, you have to enable me to screen share. We, let's see, we got some folks on the team here. 
that should be able to help out. Yeah, it's again, it it draws on many folks. So again, who gave a slave narrative lamenting her, you know, the treatment of her mother and and the threat of constant sail to the deep south. And she says in 37, when interviewed by these black interviewers, I hope. I hope the waters rise and drown white people and and drown them off the land. So that's kind of where it comes comes out of um, incantation. Here we go. Okay. So again, it's experimental. So can y'all see it? We can oh, see right. it. Yep. Okay. Let me. Sorry, I'm struggling. Okay, give me one second. <laughs> you would think in Zoom world, I would know already how to do all of this. Ugh. Okay, one second. Okay. Okay. As individual droplets of water, water is still water. And yet, as an individual drop, water can hardly constitute a flood. Yet it is the community of the uncountable other droplets that the tide rises, that the flood manifests. As individual droplets of water, water is still water. And yet, as an individual drop, water can hardly constitute a flood. Yet it is the community of the uncountable other droplets that the tide rises, that the flood manifests. The tide. Yet rises. it is the community of the uncountable the other droplets that the tide rises, that the, tide the flood rises. manifests. That the flood manifests. That the tide rises. That the flood manifests. That the flood manifests. The tide rises. That the flood manifests. That the flood manifests the tide rises, that the flood manifests, that the flood manifests, that the flood manifests, that the flood Yet manifests. Yet it is the community of the uncountable other droplets that the tide rises, that the flood manifests. That the flood manifests. That the flood manifests. Yet it is the community the of the uncountable manifests. other droplets that the tide rises. That the flood manifests. That the flood manifests. That the flood manifests. The tide that the rises. flood manifests. That the flood manifests. That the flood manifests. That the flood manifests. Yet it is the community the of the manifests. uncountable other droplets that the tide that rises. The flood manifests. That the flood manifests. That the flood manifests. That the flood manifests. Yet it is the community of the uncountable other droplets that the tide that the flood manifests. That the flood manifests. That the flood manifests. The tide rises. That the flood manifests. That the flood manifests. The tide rises. That the flood manifests. As individual droplets of water, water is the still tide water. rises. And yet, as an individual drop, manifests. water can hardly constitute a flood. Yet it is the community of the uncountable other droplets that the tide rises, that the flood manifests. The tide rises, that the flood manifests. As individual droplets of water, water is still water. And yet, as an individual drop, water can hardly constitute a flood. Yet it is the community of the uncountable other droplets that the tide rises, that the flood manifests.
These timeless elements remind us that the current social, political, and economic order is historical, and therefore that it can change. We alone have the power to change it. Together we are a mighty force, unstoppable, ungovernable, uncontrolled, and undammed. The river was here before us, and it will continue its course when we are gone, and perhaps forgotten. These timeless together we are a mighty force, social, stoppable, and ungovernable, uncontrolled, and, and therefore that it can change. The tide we rises, alone have the power to change that it. the flood manifests. Together we are a mighty force, unstoppable, rises, ungovernable, uncontrolled, flood and manifests. undamped. The river was here before us, and it will continue its course when we are gone, and perhaps forgotten. Together we are a mighty force, rises, unstoppable, ungovernable, flood uncontrolled, manifests. and undamped. The river was here before us, and it will continue the tide its course rises, when we are gone, and perhaps that the flood gone. manifests. Together we are a mighty force, the tide rises, unstoppable, ungovernable, the flood uncontrolled, and undamped. The tide rises, that the flood manifests. The river was here before us, and it will continue its course when we are this gone, future and order and render it the mud out of which our collective future can grow. Together we are a mighty force, unstoppable, ungovernable, uncontrolled, and un. Together we are a mighty force, unstoppable. Together we are a mighty force, unstoppable, ungovernable, uncontrolled. Together we are a mighty force, unstoppable, ungovernable, uncontrolled. Together we are a mighty force, unstoppable, ungovernable. Together we are a mighty force, unstoppable, ungovernable, uncontrolled, and undamped. We gather like the winds of the storm from the east, from the west, from the north, and from the south. Together, we are powerful. We gather like the winds of the storm from the east, from the west, from the north, and from the south. Like the winds of the storm. Together, we are from powerful. The east. From the west, we gather like, like the winds of the storm from the south, from the east. Together, from the west, we are powerful. From the north. Together from the side of people strike. Together we are powerful. We gather like the winds of the storm. We gather like the winds of the storm from the west, from the east, from the, north, from the west, and from the, from south. the north, together and from the south. We are powerful. Together we are powerful. We are people strong. We gather like the winds of the storm from the we east. We gather like the winds of the west, storm from the north, and from the west. And from the west. Together we are powerful. Together we are powerful. We are people strong.
to wash away and also to bring life, generating mud for new growth. We have the capacity to wash away and also to bring life, generating mud for new growth. We have the capacity to wash Together away and also force. to bring life, stop generating mud for new growth. Uncontrolled and undamped. We have the capacity to wash away and also to bring life, generating mud for new growth. We have the capacity to wash away and also to bring life, generating Together mud we are a mighty force, unstoppable, ungovernable, we have the capacity uncontrolled, to wash and away undamped. and also to bring life, generating mud for new growth. We have the capacity to wash away and also to bring life, Together we are a mighty force, growth. unstoppable, we have the ungovernable, to wash uncontrolled, and, and also undamped. to bring life, generating mud for new growth. We have the capacity to wash away and also to bring Together life, we are a mighty force, mud unstoppable, ungovernable, We have the capacity to wash undamped. away and also to bring life, generating mud for new growth. Together we are a mighty force. We have the capacity to wash away and also to bring life and ungenerating mud for new growth. We have the capacity to wash away and also to bring life, generating mud for new growth. Together we are a mighty force, unstoppable, ungovernable, uncontrolled, and undamned. Together we are a mighty force, unstoppable, ungovernable, uncontrolled, and undamned. Yay. Thanks. That was beautiful. I appreciate it. Powerful. <clears throat> Ooh, I have so many thoughts. If you should just drop dropped a note in here and she's seen it a, a number of times um, and is curious about the repetition that reminds her of a meditative practice and the power of constant and consistent practice of incantation. Um, is that part of the energy you're tapping into with the film? Yeah, I mean, I think, you know, I think we have to practice our freedom and we have to um, invoke our freedom and we have to use incantation we, we, this is a as much as it's an all hands on deck kind of thing it's a all of our energies on deck kind of thing and I think you know we have this powerful history of the capacity to invoke another world to encant another world and I wanted to I wanted to play with that I also wanted to play with um, these long shots um, I Claudrina Harold and Kevin Everson make you um, have done a whole bunch of like 10 films together. They make you watch moments and stuff. And I, I'm particularly, I was particularly drawn to this, the, that storm footage is from a hurricane. Um, I, at this point, the names all blur together. Who even knows what hurricane it was? That was last summer, it seems like 2000 hurricanes ago. <laughs> but it's like, you know, um, I think, you know, I remember, you know, in Virginia, the kind of um, notion that you had to listen or watch God's work through storms. Um, I wanted to play with and make folks watch it and think about, I guess, contemplate Black divinity and our connection to, to that realm. And to draw that out is the possibility for as much as we know all of us in many ways, we know the science, not I Amy, mean, as we talked about, maybe not the data, but just we know it. And like, you know, just being able to activate that as a different matter. And I think we need uh, we need these histories and re of repetition of incantation of of that possibility. And also, I mean, actual actual alternative religious practices. But um, yeah, that's kind of what I was playing with. So thank you for that. 
yeah and thank you for the invitation to present it so for sure thank you so much for sharing this was my first time seeing it i was like i could watch this before but i'm a i'm gonna let it be fresh when, when i watch it and i love that you just shared you were like it's yes we need all hands on deck and, and we have to to practice freedom however it like all of our energies are combined and, co and you know contribute to it and for me as like an energy scholar i always think about how you know like energy is a capacity to do work and and work is you know you know in the very physics definition i might um you know this is the engineer in me you know like work is you know move, applying some force over some distance and people conflate energy and power and and truly power is a rate at which we use energy or, um, you know, so are we charging things up or are we um, depleting things? And just hearing just how the, the, the words were, were repeated about us, you know, individually, like you wouldn't think about a flood happening, but, you know, like collectively these water droplets, um, you know, come together to, to constitute a storm or a flood um yeah it was, it was just really powerful just to to sit with it um and seeing how like you know you were at the water you know doing the incantations or you know just being in relationship with the land and the water um and then the last part you know like really bringing it back in about how you know we can wash things away away we bring life and generate this mud and, and people don't like when things get muddy but that that's truly like where um, the growth happens and, and where we see transformation. And so all of that, you know, ecological process and is required. Um, it's also really exciting to see that you're able to do this work and be be a faculty member. And so being able to tap in to your creative side is, um, it's inspiring to say the least. Thank you for that reflection. Yeah, and I, I mean, ain't no faculty line gonna give you no credit for none of this shit. So you just have to do your work, whatever that looks like for you. And, you know, hold down your, whatever they require so you can, cause in this world, we still gotta eat um, and pay for food until we get the new world pending. Like we still gotta eat. And so, you know, but you have to do your, if we delimit black studies and black possibility, to academic standards that we already lost and we already did. <laughs> they're, mm -hmm. they're plantations and they're not, you know, many of them quite literally, they're not, um, they're not made for our benefit or our liberation. Um, and that doesn't mean, I think we have to have a fleeting relationship, even within certain black studies. We <laughs> let's, that's maybe another topic for another time, but even within certain black studies infrastructures that have conflated institutionality with the work. Um, we have to we have to have a fleeting relationship with that. So, you know, I do this and maybe it'll be a cherry on top sometimes when these folks um, feel like what you're doing, they want to vibe with for that moment. Um, but blackness in the academy is always an in and out vogue. If you premise your work on that, you don't do shit. So mm. do, what, do what you got to do. Um, and for me, as y'all saw in the middle, people strike is in the middle of this. I mean, um, doing, you know, people strike emerged out of Kali Akuno's call with Cooperation Jackson for a, a general strike in response to um, COVID disposability and all of that. Um, so, you know, I've been working with them in their environmental justice committee. Um, and I want to say real quickly as well, that timing, the sequence of the film is actually real. Like, I did the incantation for something else. And then, oh shit, Virginia about to get hit by a hurricane. Let me get this footage. And then the mud is the day after. So, you know, in some ways I've come to, especially at that time, it just felt like, oh, I'm just doing this shit. Um, but in some ways I've grown to almost, it almost feels like I was able to use incantation to harness that power. Um, and I think we need to do that collectively. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that. That was beautiful. Yes, and you know, just doing what 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 you want to do, what what moves you, that aren't particularly within the the confines or within the framework of the academy. So thank you for that. We have one raised hand from Amy. Um, Amy, feel free to come off of mute if you want. Like, would like to ask your question. Hi. Thank you. Um, first of all, just thank you so so much for this conversation. I'm so energized by everything that's been said here tonight. So thank you so much. Um, my question is about 
um, your organizing tactics um, and what you found to be successful. Are you, are y'all like the type that is really like up in their faces, like agitators? Or are y'all kind of shaking hands with people, being civil, sitting at the table, kind of, um, I, I do a lot of organizing in, in Oregon and I find being an agitator isn't well received and people shut down. So it's like, how, uh, how ag aggressive are you? How docile are you in your tactics? I wonder if anyone can share um, share something about that. The organizers. I mean, I'm I'm a, yeah. I consider myself an artist and an intellectual, but I'm gonna sit back on this is organizer <laughs> on here. Let me die front. <laughs> Amy, who who is your question for, or who who did you intend your question to be for? Um, just anyone that that is organizing right now. Maybe might I invite Dr. Reagan Patterson up? I know Reagan has some thoughts, and and maybe might be able to help share about just how we've organized Black and Environment Week. And um, I mean, we, we've done a, a lot of organizing. One, you're funny for bringing me to this conversation. <laughs> <laughs> um, personally, I guess I've separated the two worlds where my well, to survive graduate school, I separated the two worlds. I merged as much as I could within my dissertation. Um, I got my PhD in engineering at UC Berkeley and it is a very white hostile uh, institution that was very traumatic and harmful. And I will say um, that in order to survive and get through, because I knew I needed those three signatures, I did what I needed to do um, to get my three signatures, but still keep parts of me, but I know that and recognize that I was not able to privilege all of me. And so now in um, trying to create spaces where I can show up fully as my full self. Um, and so Black and Environment doing this work on the side, joining coalitions. Um, v mentioned that Black and Environment is part of the RBG and D ecosystem. Um, and so doing that and then trying to find jobs that allow me to show up more fully. Um, so I, so it's about successfully navigating spaces, in my opinion, um, because as Dr. Rohn said, you got to eat. <laughs> so how do you successfully navigate those spaces that pay you? But then how can we create spaces, i.e. fund our own organizations? And if you were uh, on our, if you listen to our panel, um, with Dr. Suzanne Pierre, who founded the Critical Ecology Lab, she's found out a way to do research outside of the academy. So trying to position ourselves in new ways and innovative ways, and that's part of this conversation on futures, ways that allow us to live and also create and do for our people and exist fully and heal, as uh, Dr. Roberts Gregory said, and do all the things to ensure that we can survive um, and thrive um, and do for our people ourselves. Hopefully that answered your question. Yes, Wonderful. I think so, thank you. I see Tamara is still here and, and was dropping some gems in, in the chat, but also Dr. Dorsey is unmuted. If, if you have some things you wanna um, contribute as well. You know, uh, just on this point, uh, I'm not sure we can get much out of those that aren't going to be accepting of some degree of, let us say, unreasonableness. Uh, you know, so I, I think, you know, I, I've said it, you know, really be asking uh, for the most and beyond that. And, and, and more importantly than asking, even thinking uh, for the most and, and envisioning that. And if, and if there's any way I think it's embodied in, in, in the film, uh, an incantation, uh, you know, of of the impossible. You know, reminding myself, you know, uh, you know, that's where I'm at on this. So I don't know how they do it in Oregon, but if they ain't doing it that like that, well, you know, that that's probably why that place was a a, a white supremacist enclave, uh, you know, enshrined in the state's constitution up until quite recently. Um, hundred percent 
Wonderful. Tamara, did you want to jump in and, and share some things? Yes, the, the only thing I want to just flag is that organizing is not just what happens in the basement of a church. It's not just what happens when somebody's handing you a flyer. Uh, politics is organizing just with a clean shirt. Uh, like, and ultimately, uh, what, what every single person who takes your proxy vote is doing is organizing a bunch of other people. So the question is not, is it, are you an organizer? Do you recognize that you are organizing people along an agenda? And so, so there are no rules that are different whether you are doing any of those forms of organizing, trying to socialize a thing amongst people and help them see themselves in it so that they will help you do the work. It's about dispersion, you dispersing energy. And in the same ways that gatekeepers don't build power, they, they hoard a shadow of it really good real folks who are who are really powerful make it open source and when they do that they they unleash the power of the idea because it takes on other forms that's what decentralized organizing does best so i just wanted to say that like it's always happening you are either being organized or you are organizing someone every moment that you are awake wow Thank you all so much, and, and and thank you to our panelists for even just staying on for for the film. You know, um, you all were here to eight thirty, um, and then stayed on to answer and, and contribute. Um, and thank you everyone who had stayed this long. This has been uh, an absolute wonderful two hours to just chat about Black futures and how we might continue to move forward into a place that's more just, that's more equitable, and that that centers Black love, Black liberation and um, Black livelihoods. And with that, um, we will see you all later. Be sure to follow us on social media, um, Black and Environ on Twitter, on Instagram. Um, I do want to hold space right now to just say thank you to our own organizers for Black and Environment. We would not have been able to really pull off this incredible and dynamic week without the, the help of each and every one of you. So thank you all so, so much. Um, even just now throughout the chat, like I had the job to sit here, talk to the panelists, people chiming in on private messages here, private messages on, on the Slack. Um, and so it, it truly is a team effort to um, move us into the future. And so I am excited for what is to come and I am thrilled to um, you know be in this fight with you all. Thank you all so much for, for being here. Um, have a wonderful night, be safe, be well, and see you soon. Thank y'all so much. This was great. Thank you. It was a pleasure to have you.